Welcome to Motherhood Behind the Scenes. I'm Jennifer Norris Hale with Mission Motherhood, and today's guest is one of my idols in motherhood. She is a mom, and I'm not quite sure what else she does. She's going to explain that, I think. We'll figure it out towards the end. <laughs> um, but she is an advocate for all people. But when we first met, um, she was relatively new mom, um, in the thick of things, and we just really bonded over our motherhood experience. So please help me to welcome Miss Kristen Giant. I can hear the crowd roaring. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. No, stop, please, really. <laughs> it's so wonderful to yeah, be here with thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. So you do a lot. So you do a lot. Yeah, and <laughs> full sentence. <laughs> Period. Um, and, but one of the things that I love to talk to you about and like kind of follow you um, on your journey is your experience with motherhood because it is so vulnerable, it is very raw, and it's very much a something that I personally relate to. Um, becoming a mom was, it, I suppose, um, on the opposite side of that. Becoming a mom was not something I ever thought would <laughs> be a, a part of my path. Um, but on the flip side, you've said that being a mom is something you had kind of dreamed of being or was part of that experience. Yeah. So why don't we just start there? Yeah, I think it's perfect. <laughs> Young Kristen. <laughs> so yeah, newborn Kristen, <laughs> let's start at the beginning. Um, I teach high school, that's one of the things I do, and they have like bets every day on how long it'll take me to go into a British accent. <laughs> and I think that was a record breaker of 12 seconds. <laughs> I always knew I wanted to be a mom. In fact, I used to beg my grandmother to, I didn't understand really how motherhood, babies, anything worked. I was like, could you just get a baby, hear me out, <laughs> and then I have it. Mm -hmm. Like some of my earliest memories were talking about that, just like wanting a baby um, and not a child, you know, not like to be a mom. I just wanted a baby mm -hmm. so bad. And the incredible irony of that is so far, and I'm six years into motherhood, babyhood was the worst mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. And I, I have women in my, in my orbit who keep having babies they like babyhood so much they love mm -hmm. the newborn phase they love little babies um, and I really I thought with my whole heart that that was what I wanted um, and in fact we fought really really freaking hard to become parents to a baby um, we went through about two years of infertility two miscarriages and then being a mom to babies almost mm -hmm. killed me mm -hmm. <laughs> not physically like it does for some women um, but but mentally it was um, it was such such an unexpected struggle and there are so many parts of it that I enjoyed but um, that actual world of baby just was so unbelievably hard mm -hmm. and I wanted it so bad and that gap between what I thought the dream would be and what it was 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 when you met me yeah. right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes over a little quiche we were yeah. talking about. it was a good quiche damn good quiche <laughs> the way. we remember our food days. we do um, but yeah, I, that is a really major disconnect for a lot of moms too, Under, having this expectation, unrealistic expectation of what motherhood will be and then what it actually is. And mm -hmm. so again, kind of referencing the fact that this isn't 20 years ago motherhood, this is like fresh new motherhood. This is mm -hmm. when the, within the past five years and still not having the, the people around us to kind of guide us through it or the experiences to help us mm -hmm. support us through it. Yeah. Um, or you know, and leaning on other people. I think a source of extra guilt, um, because we have like your basic generic mom guilt, you know, like Kroger brand mom guilt <laughs> um, that we all sort of have by virtue of being alive. And I think that that's a survival tool, mm -hmm. right? It keeps you waking up, it keeps you feeding your kid, it keeps you doing what you need to do. Um, and then when you layer privilege on top of that, so one of the things that I really struggled with is I have one of the most epic villages I mean, it was a tug of war with my incredible mother-in-law. She wanted the baby more than I was willing to give her the baby. Mm -hmm. um, I had, you know, fi you know, my, my finances in order. Uh, my, my body worked. Breastfeeding came naturally to me. Both of my births were uneventful. Um, I had, you know, I hate this phrase. I hate to even say it, but I had good babies, right? Mm -hmm. And I still suffered. Mm -hmm. I still suffered massively. And um, we were just talking in the break about support groups, about Everywhere I went, it was moms who had a good reason to be miserable. Mm -hmm. And then there was me who was like extra miserable. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would tell anyone who listened that I didn't enjoy being a mom. Um, yeah. And that idea that postpartum depression and anxiety, both of which I suffered from, they are, 
they are not situational necessarily. Yeah. So it's not that I didn't have a village. It's not that I didn't, you know, that I lost out on my breastfeeding journey that I'm at. None of that happened. Mm -hmm. And I was still freaking miserable so much of the time. Do you, can you pinpoint as to, or upon reflection, like what, where do you think that was a result of? I, yeah. And I preface that because I had anxiety that I didn't know about going into pregnancy. So I hadn't had the tools to understand what it really was mm. and layer on top being a mom yeah. and everything else. So how did yeah. you? All of my coping skills were dependent on me having copious amounts of time for myself. Mm. Yeah. They were all, they were, all of my coping skills had to do with time. And I didn't know that. I didn't know they were coping skills. I didn't know that I was a high functioning depressive. I didn't know that I was a high functioning anxious person. Um, a high func I mean, I have severe ADHD. But a part of how I was functioning so highly pre-children was that all my time was my own. Mm -hmm. So I could take naps. I could exercise for hours. I could journal. I could pick up my guitar and sing. I could spend quality time with people. My cup was always full mm -hmm. um, because I had time to fill it. And I think I, I, there was a period when I had a two-year-old and a newborn where I would jokingly say, I think I'm just too selfish to enjoy mm. motherhood. Um, and I've started working on flipping that a little bit of like, I need to learn new ways to care for myself. Is that what you heard yourself say or was that something that you felt other people were saying to you? Well, back with like, so if, I, if, if the Kroger mom guilt was just like mom guilt, the extra layers of designer mom guilt I had had to do with the fact that, you know, I have supportive parents. My mom was here, she was helpful. You know, we had a village, I had, an employer who allowed me to pump on the job and leave when I needed to. Um, so that sense of like, if I couldn't enjoy it, then I must be selfish. I think that was, you know, me to me. Mm -hmm. I don't really think I was hearing that from people. And, and in some ways that's the nature of anxiety mm -hmm. is it's a liar. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't have to have other liars around you. Anxiety yeah. does a good enough job yeah. on its own. <laughs> so as you're, and you're working through the, Prior to having kids and going through the loss, were you actively in therapy or were, was that something that was continu you yeah. were continuing through? Yeah, I've been okay. in therapy for, for most of my adult life, yeah. Okay. And when you experienced your, your two losses, um, your first two, how was that taking back for you as far yeah. as it, in a previous kind of conversation we talked about, you know, it, we thought it would just come easily. And yeah. it doesn't always come easily. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm so grateful to be one of the moms who gets to come out of loss with kids. And so there's no part of me that wishes it was different. Um, but when you are a part of that community who loses a baby, who loses a pregnancy, and then ends up freaking so busy with kids for the next 18 years, yeah. I have this ongoing question of like where is that grief stored in my body mm -hmm. because you know I lost pregnancies which is a painful bloody mess and then as soon as my body was done bleeding I'm trying to get pregnant again mm -hmm. um, of course because it's just like with any grief right you're like I mean I saw this blanket and I just wanted to wrap it around <laughs> okay, myself we're going there. We're going. so you're like okay <laughs> everything hurts and I'm so sad and yeah. let's get pregnant to fix the sad yeah. um, but we all know that grief exists alone yeah for the activity so I think in many ways like leaving leaving like the land of babies which I'm out of I have a four-year-old and a six-year-old it's like if I look at it I realize I've had the grief for these two lives that weren't you know that just weren't mm -hmm. it's still in my body somewhere mm -hmm. um, and I do think you know I've been very public about my miscarriages mm -hmm. which helps a bit you know anything with light on it is better um, but it's like with anything, it's like, okay, so am I allowed to have a mental breakdown eight years after I lost yes. a baby or a, <laughs> like, where do I, do I schedule yeah. time? Do I put it in my Google calendar <laughs> of like, let's mourn the loss of, and I mean, interestingly or not interestingly, it's like totally messed up. I had my first miscarriage on mother's day, <laughs> oh which was gosh. like also my law school graduation. Um, and mother's day has always felt loaded ever since then and then I had my, I had my second miscarriage in the middle of my like wedding reception um like a giant pad on actively miscarrying 
while everyone was congratulating us on our wedding and of course asking us when we were going to start a family and I'm actively losing a pregnancy that I very much you know very very much wanted um so there's there's layers of like what women carry Mm -hmm. um and I wore this shirt that says be nice because I never ever asked anyone when they were going to start a family again Mm -hmm. and I had been guilty of that um I, I I just think about like, even if it's just menstruating, like the weight that women are carrying all the time and men, Mm -hmm. of course, but just this idea of like treating myself with softness and treating the people around me with softness um, because, you know, I am a lost mother. I lost the lost community as soon as I had a successful pregnancy, Mm -hmm. which is something that I've never really gotten to mourn. Um, You also leave the infertility club the minute you have a vi- you know a pregnancy that sticks, mm-hmm. um, places where I'd received a ton of support, and I think that's it. As mothers, is we're constantly we're doing what what women do, which is build beautiful things, mm-hmm. and then the other thing that women do is leave those beautiful things, mm-hmm. get forced out, leave whatever, and mm-hmm. then we go build beautiful things, and I think we still feel really sad for the ones we got to leave behind. Yeah, and but you're constantly I like even your shirt too we're constantly fighting battles that nobody knows about um the layers of motherhood the guilt of motherhood um you know if if we didn't have these conversations or share our own stories in general with our friends and our family we need to be able to share what losses mean to us um, so that somebody else can learn and somebody else can know that they can be supported and that they're that they're not alone but Mm. um I just, I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's okay. I, what you just said made me think of something that my husband um, said when we were going through infertility that made me so mad at the time. And like a lot of his wisdom, it really ticks me off in real time. And then I give it some space and I'm like, okay, yeah, you're right again. <laughs> um, he's incredibly wise and a little bit less tactful than he is wise. But I remember when all I wanted was to be pregnant, as he said, like, do you really, are you considering that? there's gonna be a kid on the other side of this Mm. because you're obsessing about pregnancy. Um, And I think if I could go back and talk to that Kristen and talk to Kristen in the early years of both of my children's life and maybe talk to anyone that's watching this and is struggling with whatever phase they're in is like parenthood um, and the journey, the whole journey is so much longer than your monkey brain tells you it is. Um, it's not today it's this year it's not this year it's uh this you know this lifetime Mm -hmm. and i'm i just want to say after the tears i'm having so much fun being a mom right now and i'm someone whose brand was tied to loathing every bit of it for about four years (laughs) um i love you kids if you ever watch this you're (laughs) so i'm so grateful that you were uh, alive and all that um i'm just having such a blast now yeah four and six it's like this sweet spot um and i wish i could go back and hug kristen and be like be okay. Yeah, and not enjoy it. Yeah. I wouldn't say that. Yeah, I would. I'd and be it's like, okay, yeah, like keep not suffering. to enjoy it. Yeah, you know. So we've talked about motherhood, and you're really embracing it now. And it makes me think too about just when people talk, older people who have experienced all, you know, the full gamut, and have raised their children, just thinking about, you know, where they enjoyed it the most. You mm-hmm. know, we we think about, oh, you're going to enjoy it from the beginning. It's going to be <laughs> great. You're going to love it, and you're going to love it all the way through. And, like, that's not totally true either. Like, there's women, you know, we were talking about earlier who want to have a baby to just have the baby face again. And there's women who just really can't fathom having the baby face again but could take on an elementary school load of kids, you know. And I don't know if that makes sense. but Well, it does, and I've kind of done that. Yeah, yeah, you Uh, have. Back to what I'm doing. (laughs) Um, I think one of... You know this. I love one-on-one conversations with people. They are absolutely life-giving to me. Um, I leave conversations filled up no matter who I'm talking to. This is like my love language. And I do think in hindsight, non-verbal kids, like I get why that was uniquely draining to me, Mm -hmm. is that if what I get are words and they literally can't say words, (laughs) it's like, okay. (laughs) Yeah, no wonder that wasn't filling me up. Yeah. Um, if this is my thing and finding out that as they get older, I connect with them so much more deeply, Mm -hmm. um, through spoken words, um, and finding other kids to pour into knowing that I don't think 
I could survive another baby Mm -hmm. mentally. So do I want more and more of the good stuff? Yes. So what's my solution? 264 high school students (laughs) that I spend several days a week with (laughs) in my time with them. Oh my gosh, it makes me so much of a better mother mm-hmm. because I know what I'm working for. Yeah, you know, we it's were so cool. We had been talking about that as well. In the when, especially with your first child, or maybe even into your second, you are so blind going into it. You have no clue that you know tomorrow, next month is going to get better, it, or not better, but it's going to be it's more manageable different, yeah. and different and evolve. It's going to evolve. It's not just going to be this one tunnel of an experience, um, mm. and. So coming out on the other side of that, now that you have the four and six year old and there's comfort in seeing these teenagers and working with them, knowing this is where you're headed, Mm -hmm. you know, and often as moms or maybe, maybe often I generalizing here, but we just don't have the opportunity to see that anymore because of, we could go into that conversation, but um, we don't have the opportunity to see what motherhood really is. I had a thought last night that I wanted to share. Please. Okay, it's the three moms you need. Okay. Okay, here we go. This is important. I came up with it last night. Okay, we're talking (laughs) life changing. One is someone who's in the exact same phase as you. Mm. The exact same. If you can find someone with a four and a six year old, due date groups help with that. Um, The exact same phase. That is the person who you look at them and you go, they look like crap too, good, we're good, right? When you're struggling, you Mm -hmm. can see the same struggle. Someone who is two years ahead of you because in my experience, most little kid changes happen in those two year blocks Mm -hmm. where it's like a six year old is just massively different than a four year old, but somehow four year olds are a lot like five year olds and five year olds are a lot like six year olds. Mm -hmm. So finding someone who's two years ahead, they will give you hope for whatever you're in getting better. And then the last one is finding someone who is two years behind you Mm -hmm. because what they can remind you of is either how far you've come, if they're in a tougher phase, or that something good is coming. If they're like, when I have maybe a seven and nine year old, if that's a tough phase, I can look back and be like, oh, okay, they're four and six, right. Everything changes. There's hope on the other side. And when I was in that little kid phase, I wasn't close to anyone else physically Mm -hmm. who had babies at the same time. They were all two and four years older than me. So I was like, yeah, it must be nice. (laughs) Like a lot of resentment for their kids that are now at my kid's age. And I'm like, yeah freaking was nice <laughs> yeah. but I was missing that like forward I mean that that's this the present and mm-hmm. then that backwards thing and maybe it's even just people you follow on social media mm-hmm. but even even like kind of looking back or helping or it's offering help and offering experience to that mom as well to help build your own confidence as you bring totally. forward here your, your totally. own too. that's that's a really novel well <laughs> I was totally inspired. I, I maybe shed a tear in bed thinking oh. about just how lucky you are to have some of my insight. <laughs> oh, how we just all. kidding, completely. <laughs> and I mean, at the end of the day, like most gifts, most real gifts that we get in this life are heavy. Yeah. They're heavy. And like, what a joy, um, what a joy to get to do this, even on the days that it is not joyful at all. So what is something that you share or you know when you think moms who are just kind of surviving day to day and even in our own lives Mm -hmm. we're still surviving we're still in the thick of it so when moms who are really just in survival mode Mm -hmm. um you even mentioned yourself your own self-care is like truly being alone Mm -hmm. and you know building how can Mm. a mom find that space to identify really what she needs i found a lot of support in the recovery community um specifically in like the 12 steps um and i'm i'm not someone who has struggled with addiction in sort of the traditional sense but i found myself drawn to a lot of the language um just for my mental health and a big part of that in the recovery community is like every day is day one Mm. and every day is like your last day yeah and i i'm just like you know trigger warning real quick i'm about to talk about suicidal ideation Um, I struggled with wanting my life to be over a lot in the first year of my second child's life. Um, He is absolutely me in every way, um, which is, and and himself, you know, again, future Francis, you're not just me, but whatever. Um, It was a test. I mean, all the parts of myself that I hadn't found ways to love yet, 
mm. were suddenly in my arms 24 hours a day. He's relentless. He demands attention. He like will be hurt <laughs> from the day he was born. He will be hurt. <laughs> All of that was so triggering, um, triggering for me because I saw myself and I didn't love me. So how could I love this version of myself in real time? Um, and what I was working with was like, I need to make it till tomorrow. Mm. I need to make it till tomorrow. And that is enough. And, and within that, right, I have to feed my baby. I have to get my job done so I can pay bills. I have to connect with my partner because if he leaves, <laughs> this roller coaster gets a lot weirder, <laughs> right? If I'm driving, are you kidding me? Um, but every day, every day has to be enough. And that applies when you're out of the woods but it was so comforting to me when I was in the woods. And, mm -hmm. and this is, I mean, dark, but the idea would always get to be there tomorrow that I could, that I could leave, mm -hmm. that I could be done, right? Like you were comfortable. Yeah, and, 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 and I didn't have to let go of the thought that I didn't want to live anymore, mm -hmm. but that thought would keep until tomorrow, mm -hmm. as long as I did, right? Mm -hmm. As long as I could keep until tomorrow, I could hold on to that like a security blanket, which it was at the time, right, is that, okay, this doesn't have to be forever. That was, that was the only message, right? And yeah. what I found, what, what Kristen now is saying to her is it literally isn't forever, right? Right. But in that moment, all I, could, all I could hear, the only way I could receive that message was from the part of my brain that was like, maybe it won't be forever. Mm. Maybe there's an off switch. Maybe there's a way out. And the way out is through, but right. you don't hear that in the fog of mm -hmm. depression and anxiety. And I'm, I'm so grateful that I set daily goals for myself, daily goals, not to work out <laughs> daily goals to survive the day <laughs> right? daily the goal is the day um, and it it helped and it still helps on dark days where I'm like hey you know are you fed are you watered have you slept but I would I would go to bed mm -hmm. um, a I just I love sleeping so much sometimes I wonder if like my ideation about not living is more just like I just really like to sleep. <laughs> just, I just want dumpy. like lots of extra night night um, but you know go to bed tuck yourself in and make it till tomorrow yeah. those thoughts can still be there and then one day they weren't, right? Mm -hmm. I woke up, I put my jaw. I woke up and they weren't there anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I do think that saying to myself on those days, like having made it, having not done anything too stupid was enough. And it was. Yeah. I mean, I think we have the tincture of time to look back and say, no, factually it was enough. Absolutely. At the time it's like a mantra, but in hindsight, go off, sis. And true, like. Slay. <laughs> Slay. <laughs> Stanley. <laughs> um, we, one of the things, we all think like, what is enough? Like, you know, is it a hundred percent all day, every day? Is it showing up every day? And like, if you're a hundred percent, or if you're showing up and survival is 25% that day, then that is enough, mm -hmm. you know? And if you're showing up for yourself, if you're, you know, carrying through, um, it's not about reaching that hundred percent mark. Like none of us do. Mm. A girlfriend and I are talking about redefining winning and losing. And losing means losing yourself. And winning means everything else. Yeah. And it's been so liberating to kind of squeeze my life through that paradigm. Because if we think there's degrees of losing, no, there's not. There's one loss. Mm -hmm. And that would be me not choosing to go till tomorrow. Everything else is just a degree of a win. Yeah. It's a small win. It's a big win. It's a monumental win. Um, and I wish more people viewed motherhood through that lens of like, if you're still showing up for your kid the next day, first place prize, here's, <laughs> yeah. a, here's a freaking medal. <laughs> and we good. should, and it's not about, and I, we're so inundated with social media and with the pressures of society and the instability within society to achieve those, mm. you know, accolades. Um, you know, we have to be okay with just being ourselves is enough mm. and being, our, being who you are for your child is more than enough yeah you don't have to be anybody else yeah and I, when talking to new moms they still feel or still i don't think judgment is ever going to end but just the sadness i feel when they still feel judged mm -hmm. and the the journey they have to go through to get to this point where it doesn't matter yeah you know and maybe some people don't ever will never get to that point but you know planting that seed of just you are enough i feel like us as millennial gen x moms we are going to feel a wave of profound healing when Gen Z as like a not, you know, there's some, of course, some moms in Gen Z right now, but when that generation is parenting publicly, mm -hmm. we are just going to, we are going to have a healing yeah. effect as, as millennials if, if we choose to witness it. And I hope that we do mm -hmm. um, because this generation, my goodness, 
They're just incredible. Mm-hmm. And they embrace everything with authenticity. For them, the rare thing is pretending to be someone that they're not. That's such a beautiful thing because since our inception with everything around us, it's always been about perfection mm-hmm. and smoke and mirrors. Yeah. And um, I can remember posing in the hospital hours after giving birth, trying to look exceptionally skinny yeah. for having just given birth so that I could post that. It wasn't enough that I had a literally perfect baby and like a great birth and a fine partner and a huge glass of water. Yeah. I was like, oh, 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 people are going to be like, wow. Yeah, like I'm what? Get so many likes. I was performing in the yeah, delivery yeah. room. Right. And I mean, I, I will go, on, there are parts of TikToks right now, and there's some millennial moms who are still in the baby phase that are embracing it too. One of my favorites is Amber Filler Up. Um, Barefoot Blonde was her name when we were, you know, first giving birth. <laughs> but in her, this is her fourth kid, and she is like boldly embracing her postpartum body for the first time um, in any of her public pregnancies. And I am like, every time I see one of her posts, I'm sobbing. Mm-hmm. Because I'm like, I remember when me and you, because we're friends, when we both <laughs> had to, you know, get in shape after our first kid, and like, you look so, like, we're, we're doing it yeah. now. We yeah. are, and the speed of healing is so much faster. Mm-hmm. Like, my mom had her mom's crap almost identically it changed by like five degrees. And in some ways, you know, early in the millennial Gen X motherhood thing, we were like 10 degrees off from our mom. Yeah. And within five years, it's like a 180. And I just, I'm I'm excited. I'm excited about the prospects for moms. I'm excited about knowing that all of our generation is in therapy. So we're gonna not wait till we're 80 to (laughs) (laughs) figure it out. Hearing you say that gives me, you know, because I don't know what the future generation looks like. I don't, I don't have experience with Gen Z um, and any certain unembarrassing level. (laughs) 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 Only the embarrassing parts. No, Um, they're, but the promise mm, that they, that they have is really exciting. The first day of class out loud, just one thing, a student told me, um, they weren't feeling really great because they just started their period and they were having super bad cramps and they were saying it at full volume to someone they had just met and like with guys at their table. And I was like, <laughs> like what's gonna happen? Nothing happened, <laughs> yeah. spoiler, nothing. Yeah, yeah. it was, They're it's like, incredible. Oh, and it's, I mean, yeah, just the future is in good hands. Just, so speaking you have to trust of me. the future, <laughs> <laughs> I, I do trust you. <laughs> Questionable. I know you don't, I don't. I know you don't feel that safe, but I feel it is very safe. <laughs> um, so as we kind of like wrap up and, you know, think about it, we kind of want to end on in the future, like you're still in there, right? Mm-hmm. So as a mom, we lose our identities. We're not prepared in any way to lose our identity. And just thinking about, mm. you know, a conversation we were having earlier was, you know, I just, I wish that I could just go and have dinner with my friends on a whim like I used to. And maybe some mm. families can do that. That's great. <laughs> don't want to hear about it. <laughs> yeah, I don't, stop boasting about it. Um, <laughs> but we're not at that phase. Yeah. And we will get there. Mm-hmm. But it's like there's still a piece of us that is still there and still ready to appear mm. when we get through this phase yeah. of motherhood. And, you know, <laughs> how do you feel about that? Yeah. <laughs> I love, I love the question, and, and I think it's so important because inner child work matters. Um, I've done a lot of inner child work in my years of therapy, and one of the things that we talk about is, like, you don't have to find her. Mm. She's there. You don't have to find her. She's right there. She's, she's right there. there. Yeah, there's no, like, process of, like, you don't, ha- you don't need a map. Yeah. Um, and the you that you miss is just waiting. Mm-hmm. She's not dead. She's not fractured. She's not irrevocably um lost she's there yeah and and those moments when you see her are real and those moments that she tucks back away like she's hibernating Mm -hmm. she's she was tired she was (laughs) tired when you got pregnant (laughs) i mean there are parts of me that when i did first feel back in my body i overdid it so much and who i am now is this alchemy of the earliest stages of motherhood when i was fully you know fully alone Mm -hmm. and who I was before which was never really outside of the gaze and and who I really am and really was is somewhere in between those things Mm -hmm. she loves to be alone she loves to be with people Um, she wants to be perceived if you perceive her she will never forgive you right I'm I'm multitudes and Mm -hmm. I always have been and, and we all are but you don't stop existing because you don't get to perform your existence in the same way you used to Um, and when you're ready she's right there Right. Like she's right there. 
and she's not impatient. I think that's another thing is like, we almost project impatience onto ourselves. Like, I wanna be hot, I wanna be young, I wanna be thin, I wanna be who I was. And it's like, uh, you're so much better. Yeah. By virtue of continuing you know, to choose the next day and the next day, um, you are all those things and you're, you're more. Um, yeah. And I, I don't, there was a period where I missed who I was before. And now I know that you can't miss someone who's not gone. Like she's right there. She's right here. She's, she's crazy. That, she's in that just three-way like high five. <laughs> yeah. Hi, bud. <laughs> that three-way high five again. Yeah. Showed up. Showed yeah. up for you. But Thanks she always for all you're does. Doing. Yeah, of course. Thank you for being here and always being vulnerable and sharing space with everyone because we can all identify with that. Um, so I appreciate all you're doing as well. So hey, I'm having fun. Yeah. Thank you for tuning in. This has been Motherhood Behind the Scenes with the always wonderful uh, Kristen Giant. We always appreciate you, and thank you for showing. Is this, is this, this something is the Gen that I Z can heart. do? I'm just going to stick yeah, you with do the, the millennial, millennial heart. Yeah, we're coming together <laughs> okay. to heal the generation. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Love you, Kristen. Love you more. <laughs> That's true. <laughs>